Amen. Please turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews 5. We finished up Hebrews 4 last week. And we left it on the note of an exhortation to draw near to God, to receive mercy and grace to find from our great high priest, Jesus Christ. The author of the Hebrew now uh, wants to open up a vein of insight and understanding of the nature of the high priesthood that has come to its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Be reading verses 1 through 10, Hebrews 5. But uh, I guess I better first read Genesis 14, the background text to this, uh, since Hebrews 5 brings us to connect uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in his high priesthood with Melchizedek who is high priest of, of Salem, which is probably a shortened form for Jerusalem. So I'll be reading Genesis 14, and the first appearance of Melchizedek as he meets Abraham after retrieving Lot from the grip of some of the local kings around the area. Genesis 14, 17. After his return from the defeat of Shedot or Laomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shevah, that is the king's valley, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham, or Abram, gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you say I have made Abram rich. I'll take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let Aner, Eshcol, and Mamre take their share. Now Hebrews chapter 5. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Father, we do pray as we consider this theme of Christ's unique high priesthood, fulfilling all prior 
high priesthood, that your Holy Spirit would help us to understand and to look in a fresh and confident way toward him as our high priest, taken from among men to represent them in the things of God. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've seen already in Hebrews 3 and 4, uh, where the author of the Hebrews urges us to not fail to enter the heavenly rest, the Sabbath goal of God's people. And even though we found out last week that we are disqualified by the Word of God, which judges us as naked and dead, or as I said, as judges us as bare and breathless, like the Greek wrestler caught in a rear naked choke. We have one who as high priest dispenses to the likes of us mercy and grace from the throne of grace in heaven to answer our need, to answer our request, our crying out to him for help. So in chapter 5, which I just read now, the author of the Hebrews expands more richly this theme of the high priesthood so as to bring Christ into a sharper focus, a clearer view, and what that means for him to be our high priest. He wants to bring us out of the fog and out of the twilight into the clarity of Christ and his ministry to us now in heaven so that our faith uh, would be firm. Our faith would be informed uh, in him. So if you have your outline with you, you'll notice it's divided up into three points. The first are just general principles of the high priesthood, verses 1 through 4. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward because since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So we can learn from the Old Testament uh, Aaronic priesthood uh, some of the distinctive principles of being high priest. And in, in right out of the chute, that he's taken from men with regard to the things of God for men, taken from men for men regarding the things of God. Now, that, that, that little phrase, things of God, uh, uh, is the exact same phrase we find back in chapter 2 uh, when uh, Christ's manhood and particularly his consequential high priesthood uh, was brought in to the, the narrative of the book of Hebrews, uh, that the high priest uh, is merciful and faithful in the service of God, or the things of God. Uh, and so when you read that phrase, the things of God, it particularly has to do with interfacing God, interacting with God uh, in worship. It's the things of God in, in uh, chapter 2 says, to make propitiation for the sins of his people. But that was his distinctive ministry, that Christ was made flesh and blood like his brothers, chapter 2, that he might be that merciful and faithful high priest. And that, that's, an, that's an important principle of the priesthood. In order to accomplish that priesthood, the priest must be a man. But he's a man that he might, as it is, stand between men and God. He is the one who mediates the relationship. Uh, there, is no, there is no safe approach to God without a mediating high priest. The Old Testament and the author to the Hebrews wants us to understand that God is a consuming fire of pure, transcendent holiness and justice. And thus, is as it is, 
like a trap ready to be triggered, uh, lash out at sin in consuming judgment. And so the idea that somehow I'm going to approach this holy God on my own merits or in some way make an appeal to him by either beating my chest or donning some hair shirt is not safe. You're going to lose. You must have a mediator. And God himself raises that mediator out from men to represent men and bring gifts and sacrifices for sins. Because that's the problem. It's our sins that are the problem. And so the high priest must be men, a man, necessarily to deal with our very issues that, that God has with us, our sins, and to represent us. Because our hands are dirty. And therefore, the high priest comes in our place. But the, the unusual rub of the Old Testament is that in the Old Testament, though the high priest was dressed in robes of glory, they're called, robes emanating, they're supposed to in their own fashion, emanating the light and purity of heaven, the fact of the matter is Aaron and all other high priests in the Old Testament were sinners. So there's a sense in which we say, I don't know what good that is going to do for me <laughs> to send a sinner in place of a sinner. <laughs> and there we find the defect of the Old Testament. <laughs> and there we also find that the Old Testament is typological. It, it didn't stand firm on its own ground. It pointed to something greater. And that's why we find in verse 3 that the, even the priest had to first offer sacrifices for his own sins. He had, to, he had to wash up. He had to be cleansed. And then he could then function, having been forgiven and cleansed, as that typological uh, high priest representative of man for men before God. So let's not lose sight of this very fundamental chief role of the high priest. He is there to deal with our sins through sacrifices. And that idea of sacrifices regarding our sins goes all the way back to Genesis 3 and Genesis chapter 4 and runs throughout the whole of the Old Testament all the way up into the New Testament, so that when John the Baptist, the last of the Old Testament prophets, introduces Jesus, he introduces him by saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. No one stood around scratching their head going, Now what could that mean? They've been schooled in it since the beginning of time. They've been schooled in it by the very... Book of Leviticus, the Mosaic economy, and it got their attention. He was there to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Because your sins is what has created distance between you and God. And the fact of their being dealt with so that you could confess them and be cleansed of them and draw near to God and have communion with Him is a great, great blessing. Now, the Bible makes perfectly clear that the just punishment of our sins is death. You shall, sit, you shall die in the day you eat thereof. Biblically, there is no escaping this very foundational truth that sin's recompense, the wages of sin, is death. And death means separation from God. It means you have an offense where God is offended and has stepped back and withdrawn from a distance to negotiate the justice that must be issued to deal with and resolve that sin. 
Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2 says, Sin, your sins and trans, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. So the high priest is chosen. He's a chosen and appointed by God to remedy this broken, distant relationship that has incited God's wrath and judgment. And so the high priest goes ahead to restore us to God, restore us, as we learned last week, the guilty and the dead, the bare and the breathless, as we saw last week. But he is taken from men, and insofar that he's taken from men, that means that he, as it is, resonates with those he's representing. It's not an abstraction for the high priest, and that's why verse 2 says, he can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Galatians chapter 6 speaks of this idea, you know, if, if anyone's caught in a trespass, he who is spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, looking to yourself, or realizing you yourself could be the one needing restoration. And maybe tomorrow you will need it. But today, <laughs> because you understand you're a man, conscious of your own sin and frailty, you restore with gentleness, which is opposite to judgment of heart, gentleness. Now, he restores the ignorant and the wayward because, this, the, again, these are Old Testament accents. Because in the Old Testament, if you committed high-handed sin, that is, you committed outright blatant rebellion against the covenant and God's covenantal arrangement, there was no sacrifice. It's like you set aside the very fabric of the covenant itself. It's not just a mere stumble or a problem of weakness in moral failure. But the point being is that a very serious and solemn office is the office of the high priest and his responsibilities and what that high priest office is to do and accomplish. And he's dealing with matters of life and death as a man representing men before God. And so consequently, he must be called of God. It's, it's, you, know, you just don't put out the word, does anybody want to enlist today on being high priest? And oh, by the way, you could very likely, if you make a mistake on the offering, you know, lose your life. No, that's, that's not how it works. You, you, you don't see who feels himself to be the most spiritual. There must be an appointing by God. God is the one, just as Aaron was. So the office cannot be treated lightly or casually. It is an important office that uh, the self-important need not apply. It's God is the one who makes that determination. And so the Old Testament uh, outlines our need for and the role of uh, the high priest who is the one who in his ministry restores us to God. And that high priest in the Old Testament is, of course, as mentioned, uh, simply because the priests were sinners, number one, and number two, the offerings they offered were not effectual. They didn't actually wash anybody of sin. <laughs> they were sacramentally empowered because of one who is coming, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Christ is the one who's also appointed, verse 5. So also Christ did not exalt, that word exalt, he did not glorify himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I've begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So notice that in explaining this, the author of the Hebrews simply tags two Old Testament passages that have to do with Christ who is coming and now has come. And he references these two precise passages to indicate uh, when and where this high priest, 
Christ would be appointed. He supports it with Scripture. And the first text he picks is Psalm 2-7. That's why I had to sing Psalm 2-7 today. You are my son, today I have begotten you. Now you probably know, and since you've been here listening to the preaching over the past few weeks, that this verse is also quoted in verse 5 of chapter 1. Uh, to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. You are my son. So the first time the author of the Hebrews employs Psalm 2-7, it's to support the divinity of Christ. You are my son. He's of the same nature, essence as the Father. But the second time here, as he quotes again Psalm 2-7, the accent, accent is falling on the second phrase, Today I've begotten you. Now that mysterious little phrase is explained for us in the book of Acts as having to do with the resurrection of Christ from the dead. That in the resurrection, the Son of God, who's God's Son uh, in essence and nature, becomes God's Son with investiture upon the throne through resurrection. Christ is raised. Today I have begotten you. Is a reference to his resurrection along with his ascension and session up on the throne of God in Mount Zion where Jesus Christ now is today as Psalm 2-7 said the Son of God would reside. We have this very single, you might, fabric. So when you reference resurrection, uh, you, you just don't stop there as an isolated reality. Because resurrection means entrance into heaven. And entrance into heaven by the resurrected Christ means session upon the throne in heaven. He's the king. He's the king of this heavenly sphere. This upper realm of everlasting life. And so first, he is raised. First, he is, as it is, uh, taking possession of heaven in his person. As he is begotten and the king is placed upon his throne. Then follows the priestly appointment. See, that's, that's the order. As he says in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now that's quoting Psalm 110, verse 4. The most quoted psalm in the uh, New Testament, repeatedly quoted in the book of Hebrews here. Again, quoted in chapter 1 of Hebrews regarding Christ's divinity. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. But here it's verse 4 of Psalm 110, which follows... Christ's enthronement to you are not only a king of the heavenly realm, you are a priest of it as well after the order of Melchizedek. So the author of the Hebrews follows this same order. First, in possession and dominion and rule over the heavenly order the Sabbath realm. Second, the appointment now to function as the priest of that realm. To God's people, the citizens of that realm who gather around you and enjoy it. So that appointment of the priest, you see, is an appointment based upon, as the author of the Hebrews will go on to say, it's based upon an indestructible life a heavenly life. So that Christ's appointment of God to this high priesthood is not earthly. It's heavenly. So when we relate to Jesus Christ now, we relate to him as the heavenly high priest after the order of Melchizedek. It's a high priesthood of application, of redemptive fruit, 
which he a- accomplished and achieved in his life upon earth, culminating upon his suffering and death upon the cross. So we distinguish carefully between redemptive accomplishment and redemptive application. And his high priestly ministry is a ministry redemptive application based on what he has accomplished. Now that's the point of chapter 4, 14 through 16 from last week, by the way. We come to him to receive mercy and grace now in our lives. That's faith in Jesus, you see. So the author of the Hebrews identifies him with this Old Testament portrayal of Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Remember, we read about him there in Genesis chapter 14. He's the king of righteousness. That his name is Melchizedek. Means king of righteousness. And he is also king of shalom, king of peace. Of course, peace is the consequence of righteousness. Shalom comes out of first righteousness. And he, that word shalom, most understand to be Salem, king of Salem, to be Hebrew for shalom, peace, and uh, a shortened form of Jerusalem. So the picture is Melchizedek comes out of Jerusalem to meet up with Abraham as he's come into that battle, and he ministers to him with bread and wine. Now that should cause us to go, what? (laughs) Bread and wine to Abraham and his household. A covenant meal from the high priest of heaven, Melchizedek, to which Abraham responds with raised hand. So if there's any doubt about the covenantal idea going on here, that all doubt should disappear. To to raise your hand is a covenantal response of solemn loyalty and allegiance. And Abraham, with solemn raised hand, gave a tithe of trust to invest in God's kingdom and covenant while refusing to be enriched by this world. Now, right there, You see two kingdoms at work. Abraham went ahead and joined the king of Sodom to fight. But when it came to the kingdom of God, you and I are on separate sides of the equation, you see. He's with Melchizedek. And Abraham receives the application of blessing from heaven in bread and wine, which is the sacramental means of grace of the new covenant. Melchizedek is proleptic of Christ. Amazing interplay here of, 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 of union of the Abrahamic covenant with the new covenant. So Melchizedek The king priest typifies Christ in his eternal priesthood who brings mercy and grace to help in time of need. But especially here, the administration of the Lord's Supper, bread and wine. The means of grace. The means of grace are especially administered to Abraham sacramentally. So the author of the Hebrew then, in verses 7 through 10, grounds uh, this ministry, this Melchizedekian ministry that is uh, out of Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem. Melchizedek came from the earthly Jerusalem, which is typological of now the heavenly Jerusalem, that Jesus, who's fulfilled that ministry, now brings to us mercy and grace. He grounds that in Christ's earthly life. Verses 7 through 10. In the days of his flesh. See, right, see the shift? Verse 5 and 6 from the heavenly. Verse 5 and 6. Seated you in heaven. Melchizedekian ministry, which is heavenly. Now he shifts right before all that 
in the days of his flesh. Jesus offered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence or, or because of his fear. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Again, you see the eternal is connected with Melchizedek. That's the distinctive high priesthood of Christ now. It says he offered, Jesus offered in verse 7, prayers and supplications. That's the same word in verses 1 and 3 for offering sacrifices for sin. He offered up as his sacrifices to God, prayer and supplication with loud cries and tears. With tears, our Lord Jesus Christ in Gethsemane wrestled with God's will. Is it possible for this cup of wrath to pass from me? And he was sweating drops of blood. The intensity of this moment we are unable to enter into. But it was physically running through him with drops of blood. And with tears he is crying out, to God, wrestling in his humanity with the unbelievable weight and expectation of what lie before him, of drinking that cup. And drinking it for us. But not only drinking that cup for us in the cross, but also modeling for us this same phenomenon of wrestling with the will of God in suffering. As Peter said, he, his cross is a model for us to walk in. It's a model the Apostle Paul said he himself wrestled with God's word, will in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He wrestled with the will three times, just like Jesus, three times approaching God in prayer, asking if possibly uh, he might uh, do an end run around the cursed thorn pressing into his flesh, to which the answer was no, even as the answer was no to the Son of God. But Paul, you see, is, is, is uh, as it is, entering in, just as we are called to enter in. And you will, and you probably already have, suffered, wrestling, with the will of God and suffering in this life. And if you do so, you do so because of your union with Christ, because the cross is being reproduced in your life. And so Christ brought forth loud cryings and tears as he wrestled with it, even as we too, in union with Christ, will wrestle with the application of this cursed world who our lives, our fallen, cursed bodies in this life, with the cross and God's will. And the text tells us that he was saved. The text tells us he was saved from death. Now, when the text tells you he was saved from death, it does not mean he got to avoid the cross. It means he went through the cross. And he was saved out of death. Christ cries out to God from before the cross and on the cross. Psalm 22, there are word-for-word -word prayers. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Psalm 69 and other psalms, they're all anticipating Christ suffering, crying, tearing before the Father. And he is heard not to be delivered from the cup, but delivered out from underneath it. 
he must drink that cup. But he will be delivered from the consequences of that cup. And he was heard because of his reverence. His reverence, his humble, godly submission to the will of God, though that will of God was a sword right into him. It was a bitter cup. But he submitted. No sin. No resistance. No denial. But embracing. In humble, God-fearing obedience. And he suffered for you and for me. He suffered obediently. He was obedient because in his obedience to the Father, he loves the Father and fulfills the law of God in his obedience. Psalm 40, later quoted in Hebrews chapter 10, I have come to do thy will, O God. He comes to keep the law of God. He comes to love God and, and obey Him through the end. The active obedience of Jesus Christ through suffering. The passive obedience of Jesus Christ as He took upon Himself the cursing and the death sentence and the wrath of God making propitiation for the sins of His people. He learned obedience through the contrary pressure of suffering. Oh, how many times, how many times have you and I, because of suffering, disobeyed? Because of suffering, would not do. And even feel a little justified in it. I'm only human. True, sinful human. But Christ persevered into the maturity and richness of obedience through suffering. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law for us, you see, in His obedience positively, that we might be clothed in perfect righteousness. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law for us in making propitiation and suffering the curse that He carried to forever lay to rest for you and me, that we might be forgiven and delivered from wrath, for which we must be forever endear endured to Jesus and grateful. And because of this, the author of the Hebrews tells us in verse 9 that as he learned obedience through what he suffered, he was made perfect. Now, that is in the passive tense. It didn't, it's not that he became perfect. He was made perfect. It's in the passive voice. This is what the Father did. The Father perfected him. Telos brought him into the realm of the goal. Brought him into the realm of you are my son. This day I've begotten you. Brought him into glory made him glorious, raised him, wherein he ascended and was seated at his right hand. As mentioned already, he is that high priest who because of his high priestly ministry in heaven, as the author goes on to say here, is the source. From heaven, he's the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, submit to him. Embrace Him. Conform to His plan and His purposes. Because that's the rub. Will I or will I not conform to Him as He has set forth His plan and purposes in this great high priest? Being designated, verse 10, by God, you see, in the eternal realm as a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. That Melchizedekian order is the eternal order of the application of salvation to all those who come to Christ and refuse the danger and the destruction of an end run around Christ, which the author to the Hebrews warns against, does he not, repeatedly. 
He arrives first in heaven, then he is appointed, having arrived there as the appropriate Melchizedekian high priest. This is not the dying aspect, but the living aspect of his priesthood, where he applies what he has accomplished in the dying aspect, the suffering aspect in his flesh and blood. There is movement here. Movement from redemptive accomplishment to redemptive application, which is based on redemptive accomplishment in Christ's life and suffering and death. And it's out of this, you see. It's out of redemptive application as that priest in heaven that he now brings to you and me bread and wine. The Melchizedekian priesthood. The covenant blessing that he has acquired. The blessings of mercy and grace wherein like Abraham we surrender to him in covenantal response of raised hand. You have given yourself for me, O Christ. I swear my allegiance and love for you in response. I surrender. A joyful reception to receive what God offers in Christ, our high priest. And so with Abraham, and with the great company of Abraham's vast seed, we pray by faith. I'm yours, O Christ. You have loved me. You have offered up yourself for me. And now from heaven you feed me with mercy and grace by bread and wine. Here is my tithe. Here is my life I offer to you by faith, my precious high priest who satisfies the law in obedient suffering to bring me to God, to bring me to God. To God in communion with Him, in grace and in glory. Amen. Let us pray.